Welcome back to the Jesus Discussion. Um, if you're just joining us, just to catch you up, we're we're talking about um, who was Jesus. The the question of you know who was Jesus, uh, the Jesus from the first century, the Jesus that the 66 writings found within the the Christian Bible um, discuss. And you know, for me, I'm I'm trying to live my life like that ancient Jesus, and so. Now, I have a choice. I can either go after the things that I think are awesome and just bring Jesus along with me and say, oh, he likes those things too. Or I can realize I'm not a perfect person. So there's some things that I probably need to reevaluate. So I can go back and try and figure out better who Jesus was so that I can align my life to that. Um, you know, and it, it, it's really easy and, and we do it innocently enough, but it's it's easy enough to, to you know, look at our our you know, social view or political view or preferences in life or even personality and say, yeah, hey, Jesus is like that, you know, because it's, it would be good if Jesus was, was like us. But, uh, you know, we're, we're going back into this discussion of who the ancient Jesus was so that we can have a better sense of what our aspiration is, what my aspiration is in terms of trying to be like um, that ancient Jesus. And so, the, you know, before you start to talk about how that ancient Jesus applies to how we live within this life, we, we have to get back and understand what these ancient people thought about who Jesus was. And Everett, you talked about this being kind of a two-layered discussion uh, before. Well, in, in terms of um, the fact that we're, we're dealing with the, the events of that are recorded here, the, the teaching of Jesus and the, the stories that Mark records, we, all, we also have to ask ourselves, why did Mark record that story or that teaching as opposed to something else? Uh, obviously, uh, you can't uh, put someone's whole life story in 16 chapters, uh, short chapters at that. Um, so, one of the things we always want to be looking at is the significance not only of what is being said and and how it's being said but why um, the the gospel writer mark included those stories right so a recap about who mark is then um he's not likely not one of the 12 disciples he's the mark who journeyed with barnabas and and paul um as that the book of Acts records. Um, he's likely someone who was taught by Peter. So there's elements of things he learned from Peter and elements of things he learned from Paul and or Barnabas. And, and um, he's got, uh, he's a bit of a traveled person. So he's, he hasn't just lived in a bubble um, in Jerusalem. Um, and he's likely writing to a Roman audience. Um, and you had mentioned before that one of the indicators of that is because when he mentions a Jewish custom, he tends to explain it. Now, we also talked about the significance of the opening line that, you know, it's it's shocking to both cultures that in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of God. And that's a, a pretty powerful statement. We talked about the quote from Isaiah, that there's a plausibility that the people who are reading this had been reading from these Old Testament documents because before, you know, Mark was likely the first of the documents we have left from the first century that we have access to. We don't know if there were others written or there weren't others written, but of the ones that are left, this is likely the one that we have that came first. Chronologically. So, chronologically chronolog first, right. Right. So... Maybe there was other documents and other letters being written around before that, but this is the one that that um, was copied so many times because the other early followers were like, "Yeah, this like this. This is the stuff." Um, and likely that the audience of this, if they had been reading anything about Jesus, it was likely coming from what we would call the Old Testament now, those early thirty-nine books. So we've got quotes from Isaiah, we've got um, other references that we'll talk about as they come up. And what we've gone through is the beginning. We've gone this quote from Isaiah, and then we talked about John as this uh, 
picture of, of, you know, the prophet, you know, locusts and honey and coming from the wilderness or, or the desert. And everyone is getting baptized by John. And he says, I'm not fit to untie the sandals of who's, who's coming after me. And John through Mark kind of serves as this, um, preamble convention to, to Jesus, uh, on, you know, when you look at the, how the narrative goes and we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit. Is there anything else that I've missed in terms of just kind of catching up our audience? Cause we're, we're going to jump in around verse nine and we did go pretty slow in the start, but we will pick up the pace, uh, and, and slow down at times, depending on, you know, exactly how much is in each little chunk or section. Right. Uh, but did I you, leave anything out? The only thing, the only other thing I would say is, um, John's odd um, attire and his diet takes us back to uh, the the prophet Elijah. And the prophecy was that Elijah would come before the Messiah. And we see uh, Mark, why did he record what he wore, what John wore? Why did he record what John ate? And that's in order for those who were familiar with that prophecy to start making a connection here that this individual is preparing the way for the coming king. Which leads us to talk about uh, the culture that we brought up last time of, of people who are being oppressed by a foreign country, a foreign government who is there um, against the wishes of the people of the land. And, you know, when is, when will Messiah come? When will we be saved? When will our nation be made whole? Um, and these foreigners gone and the land of God restored um, to the people of God. So they're all looking for that. And so this preamble of Elijah um, announcing the way, uh, for Jesus, but also there's um, there's a little bit where John keeps kind of coming back in a sense um, through the narrative of Mark. So he he reminds us of Elijah, but he almost is a little bit foretelling in some sense. We'll we'll get to that. So we're at verse nine, um, and uh, we'll just read this next. Uh, chunk verse 9 through 11 here. Um, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. As soon as he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending to him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, I take delight in you. Now that's from the Holman. And we talked about how it's good to see how other passages, how other translations, um, render this document because we are talking about translating a language you know it wasn't originally english it didn't originally have verse numbers and headings and things like that um, others other passages say you are my beloved son in you i am well pleased and that might be something that uh, people find a little more um, that might be the one that you've heard more so what does this chunk tell us about What's going on in, in Mark's narrative? What is Mark trying to do with this? Uh, I think one of the things that we note is that Jesus is baptized. And immediately we go, our minds go to Christian baptism. And th this is not Christian baptism. Uh, John the, the Baptist was performing a Jewish ritual, which sig signifies for them... Um, a new beginning, so to speak. And so it's it's significant that Jesus comes and identifies with the people who are coming, but I think also is saying that something here is being inaugurated that is great, and that this is from God because a voice comes from heaven and says, I am well pleased with with Jesus my son which is where Mark starts his gospel and 
this is God's stamp of approval as Jesus begins his, what we call his earthly ministry. Uh, I've heard, my favor is, is upon him. I am well pleased with you. The Holman said, I take delight in you. Um, but yeah, I, I'm well pleased. You know, something else we have here. So growing up within Christianity, you, I, I, I would, I would often hear um, verses broken down um, to the to the nth degree for theological treaties. You know, here's a theological case that I'm making off of one sentence, um, and I, I try to back away from that. Um, but there are implications at times uh, of deeper thought, and so also in this baptism we have this first hint of the the trinitarian concept um, where we've got god the father and the spirit descending on jesus like a dove um, and jesus is the son of god um, that's an interesting kind of concept to work in um, what how do you think an early audience would would perceive that everett um i think an early audience it, Everybody, whenever anything happens, we always interpret it within our own frame of reference and our own backgrounds. Um, and, and so an early Jewish audience might look at this and not attach the same significance that, that we would as modern followers of Christ. But then we've had... 2,000 years of, of Bible reading and interpretation and, and education and understanding to put this in that context. And so it, it was probably startling. I mean, when you hear the voice of, of God come from heaven, if you're not startled and amazed, uh, you don't know what's going on. So, so Jesus, one of the things that I think that that I get from the ministry of Jesus, as as Mark records it, is that he was always surprising people because he went outside their expectations. Yeah, but not going outside their expectations simply to be outside their expectations. No, it really um, it reveals how counterintuitive to basic human instinct, the, the, the message of Jesus is. Um, right. And, and, you know, we, we, as I said, we all interpret things from our own frame of reference. And we have to be careful doing that. And I say that, you know, contemporary uh, believers have to be careful about um, trying to read our uh, cultural um, life back into these passages and try to understand them from the perspective of what must this have been like for for the Jews for these startling things to happen because what happens and this is just a human tendency is that you build up a a theology that may only be partially related to scripture, but not completely scriptural. And what had happened for the Jews, and this is just that we all do this, but what had happened for the Jews is they had gotten away from God's original intent. So when Jesus breaks through and does these amazing things, it, it startles them and it really draws a negative reaction from the leadership because it's, this is not the way it's always been done. But this, obviously this is, this is Mark saying, no, if you oppose Jesus, you're, you're really, you've got it wrong because God is saying, this is, my, uh, this is my beloved son and you need to listen to what he is saying. It, it really challenges, um, you know, if you feel like it's easy when I watch a movie that someone's doing about Jesus or hear, you know, see a thing or, or whatever, 
you know, they're, they're always going to be imperfect because, you know, we just, we have limited data. So, you know, sometimes the, the movies just are going to not, not be perfect. That's okay. But, um, sometimes the, the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees are portrayed as real villains. Like they have this horrible intent, but I don't know that they th thought on the average that when they looked in the mirror, they thought I'm a bad guy, you know? Right. <laughs> I mean, they, they're leading the temple ritual. They're trying to make things right for God's people. And think about that if you're a, a leader and all of a sudden God's beloved son comes and he starts speaking against what you've been doing. And from your perspective, you've been trying to do it right. And it, it would create some insecurity and some challenge. And you would have a choice. Do I harden my position or do I reevaluate my position? And, um, and in fairness to those folks, uh, you know, we, we tend to think of this as a monolithic group that opposed Jesus throughout his, his life and his work. But many of them eventually, or even during Christ's own lifetime, Jesus' own lifetime, uh, became followers. Yeah, you think you look at even just the the record of Paul, who comes from that group. Um, the people who were not for Jesus was persecuting Christians, you know, but but clearly from the narrative, he had earnest um, desire to be doing the the right thing. So Mark is probably not trying to teach the Trinity here, is what we've come around to. If if I'm right, not to put words in in your mouth, but he does mention something that is true and um just because he's not teaching it doesn't mean that it's not um supportive of that concept right he's introducing excuse me introducing us to some concepts that will be developed as we go but mark is not writing a you know a, a textbook on theology he's telling the story of jesus so there's going to be things that don't really resolve in the beginning. So you can't really right. break down and get to the point in every little verse. You've got to let Mark lead you there over right. the course of his writing. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay, great. So we've got this baptism of Jesus. We've got Elijah stepping, the, the picture of Elijah, of John the Baptist, you know, the, the Elijah to come before the Messiah, stepping mm -hmm. out of the way and saying, this is the guy. We've got the right. voice of God saying, you are my beloved son, which echoes the first verse, like you said. Mm -hmm. And now we're moving on to uh, this next little chunk here, verse 12 through just 12 and 13. Yes. Um, it, immediately the spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. Now that was the NASB, but let's just hear it in, in the NIV for fun. Um, at once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended to him. So I, I know that we use the phrase tempted, but I've heard that, that you could also translate that tested in this passage. Yes. And I'm, I'm with the idea that that might actually be a, a better rendering of what Mark might be trying to do here. That he's setting the tone for how he's going to portray Jesus for the rest of his his gospel in some sense as tested. Would how would you see that? I I think I agree with that. The this wasn't the only temptation that Jesus faced. But it's it's worth I mean it's it's important for us to note that Jesus begins his ministry and, you know, Mark's favorite word is immediately or, you know, right away. Um, that right at the beginning and throughout his ministry, he faces temptation. Um, or, if you will, testing uh, of, his, of his commitment as a man to follow God. Yeah. And when we talk about the... So a Roman audience is getting this, and a Roman audience Correct. is likely thinking about the Jewish audience that experienced this, 
Mm -hmm. But a Roman audience finds in its culture, you know, in American culture, let me take an aside here before I talk about the Roman audience. In American culture, you know, we have traditionally valued success. Someone who is successful then finds themselves in a position to speak with authority in America because that's a value that we have as a society. Um, so, you know, when we tell stories of Jesus, sometimes we highlight his success, um, that he came to do what he wanted and he did that. But to a Roman audience, they kind of valued this overcoming the, the challenges, the, the Hercules element of things that that the hero is challenged and overcomes the challenge and ascends to his to his place as the hero uh the conqueror and, um, and, and Mark, i wonder go ahead yeah no i just wonder how much of that use of the word testing is really appealing to that roman audience here is his challenge look at what he was challenged with he was challenged for 40 days um and, and divinely the angels begin to serve him in that time and notice that even it even mentions the wild beasts. So the, somehow the it says he was with wild beasts. That somehow that that challenge included things that people who lived in in uh, an agrarian society or people who lived in a Roman culture could look at and say um, he he overcame even the challenge of being out there among the wild animals. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, and that is tied back to the origins of, um, you know, that if you want to look up the Minotaur and, and I believe it's Romulus and the two brothers that, you know, are the founders of Rome and the Roman culture, you can find within their folklore narrative of, of Rome and its origin and and as it as you travel forward through the history of Rome from that or originating point, you find a lot of that kind of um, talk. That... Yeah, the, the Romulus and Remus, the founders of of Rome, supposedly were supposedly uh, nursed by wolves. Right. Yeah, it, it's a it's a really interesting narrative to to look at that and. Um, uh, a lot of the things that, you know, we could ever, you and I could spend a couple hours just talking about the origins of Rome, but it is in there, in their culture, that this would be kind of a connecting point of, of value that they would, oh, cool. He's a guy who was with the wild animals and the angels served him and he was being tested. And that, that draws a Roman audience in. They lean forward to see, well, who is he? Mm -hmm. And he, he overcame those challenges. Right. Okay, so then we go back to John here. After John was arrested, uh, this is verse 14. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee, preaching the good news of God. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. I'd like to talk about a couple of things in there uh, with some detail, uh, like the, the phrase repent and, um, you know, the good news and, and some things like that that we've talked a little bit about before. But you notice, um, you know, for our listener that we have John setting up Jesus and then John gets out of the way um, and he's arrested. And here comes Jesus doing the same thing John was apparently arrested for. Jesus is, John was preaching the good news and saying the kingdom is, is at hand, you know, the one who's going to come after me, I'm not worthy to untie his, his sandals in order to wash his feet. I can't even start, start that. And here Jesus comes doing the same thing that John got, got arrested for. So there's some narrative lead in there a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And w what else do we have to say about that, that chunk? Um, it, it's interesting how God works sometimes. You know, John is obviously a person sold out to God, uh, totally committed. And yet, how does... How does he get moved out of the way? Uh, he's arrested. He's put in prison, and and we know later on, it it wasn't a it wasn't a pleasant existence. And uh, the uh, the other thing is, he talks about or in um, Jesus says repent, 
and believe in the good news. And when we think of repent, we've sort of um, turned that word into something that means, well, you've got to clean up your act and straighten up your life. Um, that, that's not what the word means here. It means to change your mind. So we're not talking about a situation where people can only come to God if they've got their act completely together. But it's necessary to change your mind about God or you're never going to come to him. Think about it. He's, he's saying believe to have faith in the good news. How can you have faith in the good news unless you first change your mind about the good news? And he'll talk about that a little bit. That's a bit of a recurring theme in terms of what is the good news and changing yes. your mind toward the good news. That's a kind of a recurring theme through Mark. It's a recurring theme through early Christianity that, that early authors would write uh, things like, um, the one who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion, implying an ongoing change, an ongoing change of mind. Paul says, um, you know, in, in Romans, he said, you know, daily I, I try and renew my mind and then live that out so that we're trying to, as I said in the introduction, we're trying to change and conform to Jesus instead of say, oh, I'm with Jesus. So therefore, wherever I go, he already affirmed that. You know, no, we're, we're doing the other thing. We're right. changing. Correct. The other thing that we often see about repent is that people will say, um, you know, people will imply that repent means to grovel or to feel bad about your problems. And I'm not saying that it's terrible if you have um, a moment of sorrow over things that you've done. Um, but I don't think that's a prerequisite of changing your mind. Um and, and I think it's a misunderstanding, or at least a partial misunderstanding, of what the word means. It, as you said, this wasn't written in 21st century or 20th century English. So the word repent here doesn't carry with it the same baggage that we have today. I've actually heard people say um, that if you're not crying, you're not truly repentant. And... That's, that's a misunderstanding of what Mark is saying here. He's saying that you need to change your mind, or Jesus is saying you need to change your mind and put your, put your trust in the good news. And we have in here, you know, I, I know if you were hearing this in, you know, in a church on Sunday, it would be hard for someone, it would be hard for me if I was teaching a message or something on a typical congregation, you know, and I got half an hour to work in this chunk and I see good news, it'd be hard for me not to want to explain it. But Mark hasn't explained it yet. He said, I'm going to tell you about the good news of Jesus, the Son of God. That's his opening. And then he goes on to start to tell the narrative. And this is just part of the narrative. And he's bringing back that theme, reminding the listener, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. This is about the good news. Let me explain. Um, so teasing us on, repent and believe the good news. And we lean in, okay, this is the guy who overcame the wild beasts and was ministered to by angels. And God himself said, this is my son. I'm well pleased with him. And the prophet who everyone was listening to, who was making such a big noise, um, said, I'm not even worthy to untie this guy's sandals. And the prophet is arrested and there's some, some doom associated then with what's going on that that the uproar is having a negative impact in the culture on some level um, with certain people of authority. So John's arrested and Jesus just comes right into his place and says, repent and believe the good news. Um, yeah, so there's a bit of a, 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 a negative omen here with, <laughs> with John being arrested. Um, so, that, so it's not going to be... Uh... Green lights and blue skies, right? Right. And, and I mean, think about this. If, if a prophet, if it says that people were coming from Jerusalem and all over the Judean countryside, where they were flocking to him. Now, if you are a teacher or a scribe or um, a religious leader and you're getting together on the temple courts and you're ready to teach your 
your crew and there's three or four people missing or more, you're going to go, where's, where'd those guys go? People took note that people are saying repent. Well, repent from what? Well, there's an established thing going on and here the Messiah comes and says, change your mind from that. Um, right. and that's kind exactly. of an early on theme. Right. I agree completely. All right. That's Everett. I, I, that's what I look for. If you agree completely, I'm good. <laughs> Raise your sights. <laughs> Raise my sights. <laughs> I've got, I've got the bar set low. If you're, if you're with me, I'm all right. So, um, I, I think maybe that's a good place to stop for, uh, this next chunk and la later we'll pick up at, you know, the, verse 16 and, and calling the, the first disciples, I just want to remind our listeners that you're going to get a better sense of Mark with these details if you continue to read through Mark completely as, as one book by itself. And it really doesn't take that long. And you don't have to zoom in. And in fact, it's better if you just kind of skim through, do what we call a, a pre-read, where you just set a timer for 10 or 15 minutes and keep kind of glancing up and, and checking how many pages you're turning for the time to make sure that at the end of 15 minutes, you're reading the last page. Um, and the idea is just to be aware of what's in the gospel of Mark so that when you go back and read the details, you're not trying to assemble it in a linear fashion. You've kind of scoped the, the whole of the thing. Well, one of the things that I do is I'll frequently copy it out of, a, of an online resource into a Word document and I'll get rid of the verses and I'll get rid of the chapter headings and the things like that so that I can just read what the ancient people first read, which is just a bunch of sentences together without those kind of extra markings. Uh, Everett, do you have anything else to add about uh, how we might want to um, kind of keep working through Mark in between these episodes? No, I think it's important for us to remember, though, that Mark is not like Robinson Crusoe. You read it once and, okay, I'm done with that. By the way, Robinson Crusoe is a great book. But um, it it's one of those things that there's, there's so much there that um, you we all inevitably miss as we go through. So I would encourage us to keep reading through Mark and read as you say, you know, just kind of do a gloss and get a sense of where we're going. And then uh, the, I think the more you do that, and the more familiar you become with the, the forest, as it were, then the working our way through the trees is, is there's a lot less mystery. Well, thanks for tuning in. We look forward to um, catching up with you in the, in the next episode. Thank you.